All right, everyone, it's 5.33, so we'll go ahead and get started. Just a few housekeeping items to let you know about before we begin. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on uh, the supervisor's website, on the county's website, and on his Facebook page. Everyone is muted upon arrival, and when we get to the question and answer portion of the meeting, you will be able to raise your hand in Zoom, and then when you're called on, you'll be asked to unmute yourself, and then you can begin asking your question. If you are joining us by telephone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine, and when you are called on to unmute yourself, you can press star six to do so. Uh, I'll repeat those instructions again um, later when we have our first opportunity for questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Supervisor. Thanks, Jam, and good evening to everyone, and thank you for joining us at this District 5 Town Hall meeting tonight. Uh, I know that we're all on Zoom uh, quite a bit these days, so I appreciate your willingness to dedicate part of your evening to being with us. Um, tonight, we're going to have presentations from Steve Wiesner, our Assistant Director of County Public Works, who will give us an update on road repairs throughout the valley. And Dave Reed, our Director of the County Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience, also known as OR3, uh, who will provide an update on uh, fire recovery and other initiatives. We, we will have time for questions directly after each presentation and then again at the end. And as you've heard from my analyst, uh, uh, J.M. Brown, he's going to be moderating the uh, question and answers. But before Steve begins, I, I just want to let the community know about some of the things aside from the road repairs and the fire recovery um, that has been that we've been working on in our office uh, for quite a while now. In addition to the recovery work alongside uh, OR3 and District 3 Supervisor uh, Ryan Coonerty. Um, so let's start with PG&E. Uh, this has been a very trying year with pg e to say the least, and our county uh, really has taken our response very seriously. Uh, we, um, after pg e cut down thousands of trees on private property uh, in the, the burn scar of Boulder Creek in particular in Bonnie Dune in 2020, uh, the Board of Supervisors approved filing a formal complaint against pg e at the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, this is um, an unheard of step by, for a county to take, but it was the right thing to do and I feel very good about it and uh, it got pg es attention. We're working to ensure that uh, the wood gets cleaned up and we are in, a, um, in, uh, in uh, con communications with uh, pg e right now on how to resolve this. Um, they have, uh, we've gotten a very uh, good letter back, I think, from the pg e chairman, uh, the PUC chairman, in fact. Um, I sent a letter to the Public Utilities uh, Commission President, Mary Bell Batcher, starting our, uh, stating our uh, deep concerns about uh, pg es fast trip settings that I know you have all heard about that have caused uh, numerous power outages during the last couple of months. Uh, since then, she has issued a new directive against uh, PG&E with uh, requirements to improve that system and outlined those in the letter back to me this week. I was very pleased with that. It was very strong and straightforward that they mean to do something. And so let's see if they do it. But I feel very good about uh, the response that she gave us. Um, secondly, uh, I wanted to talk about Big Basin Water. Switching over to that subject, I, I want to thank the San Lorenzo Valley Water District Board for its decision last week uh, at the meeting that I was at uh, to allow District Man Manager Rick Rogers, who does a terrific job for the district uh, and leading that district, to explore uh, consolidation uh, with the uh, SLV Water District and Big Basin Water Company. I also want to thank the district uh, for making repairs on Big Basin's behalf and supplying uh, the emergency water to the community during the recent main uh, break that they had. I visited some people as they were collecting their water uh, at the uh, district station in downtown Boulder Creek. Um, we have been encouraging consolidation uh, between uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District and, Bis and Big Basin for more than a year now in conjunction with uh, Senator Laird and Assemblyman Stone. Uh, my office has also been in close contact with the state water board uh, urging them to take seriously the corrective actions that really are needed uh, within the Big Basin system. There's about just short of 500 connections there. 
We, we look forward to helping the San Lorenzo Valley Water District explore consolidation. Uh, it's going to take some time and uh, we'll work to identify grants to reduce the cost to ratepayers in that endeavor. Uh, the Big Basin Water District is uh, a private company and it's overseen by the state, not the county. And so that complicates our, the direct involvement that we might have been able to get into early on. But uh, believe me, we have been involved from the start uh, for more than a year now. Uh, meanwhile, um, and the debris flow uh, evacuations, uh, we, the winter has begun. And while we need uh, the rain to reduce the fire danger uh, uh, and recharge our groundwater, uh, we must really alert to, uh, people to the dangers of the fast moving rain, uh, what, what the fast moving uh, rain can bring to the area. Uh, we are grateful that we were, there was no debris flows in the night of October 24th. Uh, when the storm was predicted to present the kind of conditions that could lead to a debris, debris flow situation. Uh, 3,300 properties were asked to evacuate and luckily there was no event. Uh, not many of those, uh, the 3,300 left, uh, less than a majority for sure, but uh, that's all right. We want to be uh, safe rather than safe than possibly sorry. So, uh, we recognize the challenges posted by the evacuations uh, to our customers, our, our constituents, and appreciate the cooperation of our residents uh, when we worked through this first couple of years after the fire that really heightened the, uh, the possibility of those uh, slides. And really many thanks go out to our county uh, emergency response team, the Red Cross, City of Scotts Valley, San Lorenzo Valley Unified School District, and other community organizations who coordinated the response to uh, that storm. Uh, lastly, and very briefly on redistricting, you may have heard about that. It's happening in state and federal offices as well. And the, there's a redistricting commission that oversees that in the state and federal level. The county looks at the five supervisorial districts. And as you uh, may have read, uh, they're, they we're all going through this today. And we discussed this topic today and we'll be bringing it to the county uh, supervisors um, for a final vote, uh, I hope, on November 16th. There were some late, um, late proposals that came in today, and so we were hopeful maybe we, we could uh, approve the, the, new, the new lines, but um, we're going to take another look at, uh, the majority of the board wanted to take another look at the possibilities that were some of those that were mentioned today. So with that, I did want to mention those issues that are outside of uh, roads and uh, the, the fire recovery. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce um, uh, Steve Wiesner to give an update on roads. He is the Deputy Director, Assistant Director of uh, County Public Works and has done a phenomenal job. He is a San Lorenzo Valley resident. And uh, if you call me or him or Jam or somebody, believe me, you'll get a response, I believe, in the very, uh, very quickly. So uh, with that, Steve, uh, if you could go ahead and just present your, the overview of the road situation in the San Rosa Valley. And thank you for everything you've done. You've been terrific at the response, as has your whole Public Works team overall. So I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Bruce. I really appreciate you having me here this evening to share a little bit about county roads in the valley. Um, it's, uh, we've been very busy this past year. Public Works has been, um, hopefully you all have seen us out there on the roadways. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I have a small presentation here. Um, so again, um, like Bruce said, my name is Steve Wiesner. Um, I work for Department of Public Works. I'm the assistant director here in charge of our uh, 600 mile road network that we maintain uh, throughout the county. Um, I've been with the county for about 20 years now and I've been in roads the whole time. So I know the roads pretty well. Um, and I'm sure you all know your roads pretty well too, because um, that's how we get in and out. And this is how we do everything. All of our lives are lived getting to and from everywhere we go on our county roads. So this evening, I'm gonna cover um, a little bit of the storm damage repair work that we've done over the past year. I'm gonna briefly touch on some of the re fire recovery efforts that our department has done very specific to county maintained roads. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'll touch um, on some of the pavement management work that we've been doing in the Valley as well. Um, there will be time for um, uh, questions, I think at the end of my presentation. Um, so I don't have to remind everyone here how bad uh, our winter was in 2016-17. It seemed like the rain all came at once. 
Um, and in the end, we had a tremendous amount of damage to our entire road system. Um, it, you know, we had over 200 sites damaged actually, um, but in the end, we were able to negotiate funding um, with our state and federal uh, relief damage relief partners um, to fund 194 storm damage sites. That's quite a task. Um, and it's been several years since it happened. Um, but, you know, for, for our department to put out, you know, 20, 30 um, plus projects a year is quite a bit. Um, and so we've completed to date about 83 sites um, and, and we presently have about 13 in construction. We, we estimate that the total, once we're finally done with all the projects um, in the next few years, that the total um, ticket will be about $140 million in damage. Um, and these, these sites do take a long time to repair sometimes. We've got to go through full environmental full approvals with our state and federal partners. Uh, that's why you see sometimes they do sit for two, three, four years at a time before we get to them, because we're working through that process to get permits and get all the funding. Um, so I'm just gonna cover a few of the recent ones. All of these sites have been repaired in about the last 12 to 16 months. Um, I'm gonna start with some critical projects that we completed in Lone Pico this, this past year. Um, as some of you may know, that's a one-way in, one-way out road. So it's real critical to get, to get those sites repaired as quickly as we can. Um, so here's a couple on Lone Pico. Um, and then in that same area of the valley, um, Isayani Road, which is a connector that goes all the way up to Summit, right? Another way in and out of our valley. Um, so it's critical to keep Isayani open as well. Um, so there's three sites there on Isayani. And if you can see any of these photos, you know, you, you, you can see a little bit of the drama. Um, and then here's a couple more. So um, on East Sayani, and, and as you get up towards Summit, we call it Upper Sayani. Um, so there's five significant repairs we've done there just in the last year. Um, and then working our way up the valley, uh, we're active out on Alba. Uh, this one was recently completed. Um, this is post mile 1.58. Um, and you see there's, there's a that pattern here of the type of damage that we see on our roads. Um, and, and I know you all have driven by them several times. This is one we recently repaired, repaired on Hubbard Gulch. Um, and then one up towards Boulder Creek, uh, just right off of Highway 9 there, Lorenzo Avenue. This one had been sitting for quite some time and involved the culvert as well. That was actually just recently completed within the last month. Um, and up on Jameson, you know, we had this project going when the fire hit. We were repairing three significant sites on Jameson. We had to retreat and kind of fall, you know, pull off, you know, to uh, let some of the fire activity and recovery efforts up there until we got back in and started repairing, but these are big sites. So um, we've repaired one, two, three, four significant sites on Jameson Creek Road. And so if you drive Jameson now, you can get pretty much from the top to the bottom um, in a much better fashion than you could uh, before all these repairs were done. Um, and, um, and so we're continuing, we've got, this is the projects that are actually in construction. Um, so various states right now, uh, our contractors have probably pulled off a little bit because of the rain. Um, if we can't get them done this year, we'll complete them next, next year. These are several on Alba and Felt Empire Road as well. So we're really working on these connectors that connect Highway 9 up to Empire Grade. We recognize how important they are for connectivity um, for Valley residents. And um, this is a, a repair that we're actively engaged with now on Two Bar Road. Um, we still, we know that we still have several left to do. We actually got out there and started this project on Bear Creek Road. It's actually the last one left. We have probably done seven different sites on Bear Creek Road in the last few years. We got out there and then there was a conflict with the water line out there. So we've delayed this project um, that if you drive Bear Creek Road, you've seen that the stop signs are still up and we've delayed it till next year. Uh, once the water uh, company gets in there and, and SLV Water does their thing, then we'll be able to go in and make this repair. And, um, and so here's a list of a bunch of projects that we still have left to do in the Valley. And so this is comprised of all the ones that we have left countywide as well. Um, and it's a you know, fairly robust list, but we anticipate between uh, next summer's construction season, 2022 and 2024, we should be able to complete the rest of these sites. So let's, let's hope we get enough rain to recharge our aquifers, but not so much rain that we get a whole nother slate of storm damage repairs to do. Um, okay, I'm just going to briefly uh, touch on some of the fire recovery efforts that County Roads has been up to. Um, just a little bit of data. We had uh, over four, so we had about um, 50 miles of roads, county maintained roads that were impacted in the burn zone. And um, we had over 400 signs that burned. 
And we had 32 culverts that basically, uh, you know, either melted or were damaged to a point where we, we had to replace them. We had one bridge actually that was wooden structure um, on the Swamp Road side uh, that burned out. We put a temporary bridge up and we're in the process of planning and designing a permanent replacement there. And we had nearly 4,000 feet of guardrail. And so you drive around um, up on Empire Grade and down Jameson, some of these other roads, you'll notice they're still not repaired. Um, we actually do have a contract in place. We have a contractor ready to go. Um, all of our materials are getting caught up in this whole uh, supply issue. Um, and they're probably sitting on ships somewhere. And so we're waiting for that stuff to come in. And once it does, we'll get to fixing all the guardrail. Um, so just a few little photos of some of the work. This is the bridge out there on, on Mill Creek, Swanton area. A um, couple examples of what the guardrails look like when the wood posts burn away. And, um, and I just wanna to touch on one of these other issues that is a bit of an unintended consequence of all the activity that's gone on uh, in the, within the fire zone. Um, we're starting to see the roads that are deteriorating at a much more rapid rate than we've ever seen. Um, and they're largely due to the um, vast uh, quantity of debris trucks that have been moving material in and out of um, our neighborhoods. And so we saw, you know, this road, this one on the left here, Swan, it looked great. And then two days later, it looked like this. So um, once they start to go, they go really fast. So we've gone out and actually quantified what type of damage that we're seeing out there from the debris activity, removal activities. And it's about 17 roads and we estimate it's gonna be about $4.4 million to uh, repair these roads. And a lot of them are up in the valley. You know, you recognize like Acorn Drive. Sorry for this kind of fuzzy uh, spreadsheet that I threw in there, but it's a lot of this stuff is up in, you know, the Boulder Creek area, um, Boulder Brook Drive and China Grade. So we're actively engaged right now with uh, our federal and state partners to try to fund these repairs on county maintained roads. Um, we are also aware that a lot of private roads have also been damaged by the debris removal activities. Um, and we're advocating for funding for those as well. Dave Reed is gonna touch upon that, I think in his presentation. So I'll just leave it at that, but we're, we're, we're trying to get all these roads fixed. Um, okay, so that just leads me to the pavement management program that um, we've been so fortunate to have Measure D come on board um, when the motor, uh, voters passed this measure in 2016. Um, that combined with some of the state and federal funding that we get to resurface our roads, it's really, um, it's really increased our ability to um, get our roads repaired. And so just some of the few projects that we've done in the last about year, 16 months, um, real critical ones, Mount Hermon Road, Grand Hill Road, these are our major um, collectors or minor arterials, the roads that bring us in and out of the valley, right? And so you probably noticed the work we've done on Mount Hermon and Graham Hill, um, um, but also we're focusing on some of the interior roads as well, some of the minor uh, collector roads. Uh, Glen Arbor and Heen, you see here, they were all just recently done as well. Um, and another project that's been long-term really, uh, these folks have waited for a real long time to get their own re resurfaced. And this is East Ianni. And again, East Ianni is pretty critical in that it connects Summit, you know, down into the valley. And it's another way for us to all get out of the valley should we need to. Um, and so these are just a few of the before and after pictures um, that I threw in here just for, for a little bit of um, eye, eye candy for black asphalt, if you will. Um, and uh, so that kind of leads me into some of the more local roads that we've been focusing in on. And Measure D has really brought us the ability to start um, resurfacing some of our neighborhood streets. We can't do them all one year. And we're, you've noticed that we're, we're starting to pick off roads. Um, you know, this is uh, coming up on our fourth season of Measure D projects. And so for the first couple, um, we worked on the downtown course. So Boulder Creek, downtown Ben Lomond, downtown Felton, and then now what you see is we're starting to hit some of the roads that are on the outskirts of the downtown areas. And we will continue to kind of work our way outwards um, as we plan for these Measure D projects. And so these were um, ones that we just delivered this past summer on Boulder Creek. We did five, quite a few roads off of 236 and um, south of the downtown area off of Highway 9. Um, we are able to do a little bit of work in Ben Lomond. And this actually came up as a bit of a surprise the water district came in and um, decided to tear up the roads and redo 
some of the pipes in this area. And so we decided to take a little bit of the Measure D money and combine it with some of the funding that they had to resurface just a small neighborhood um, off of Highway Net North of Alba there. And then, so this is what we have on slate for Measure D for 2022. Um, we're gonna focus in on Ben Lohman on some of the outskirts of, of uh, the downtown area and Ben Lohman starting to hit some of the roads off of Glen Arbor that are adjacent to some of the work that we've done the past couple of years. Um, and we're gonna be able to do all of Quail Hollow, which is great. That's another pretty critical connector that you know, connects Glen Arbor over to Ziani. And these are ways to get around Highway 9 when Highway 9 has problems. Um, so that's my presentation. I really appreciate everyone here and uh, all of your involvement. I would invite you, if you have any questions about roads, um, if you can't get them answered tonight, to call the Department of Public Works. You can certainly ask for me. And as Bruce said, we try to be very responsive. Um, and so with that, um, I'll stop sharing my presentation and uh, take any questions that anybody might have. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, just to remind everyone about how to ask a question, you can raise your hand in Zoom. There's a function to do that in Zoom. And then when you are called upon, you'll be asked to unmute and then you can begin speaking. And if you're joining us by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. And then when you're called on, pressing star six to unmute yourself. So let's see if we have any questions on roads. We do have one from Molly. So Molly, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. And you're unmuted. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Molly Sullivan and I live in uh, Boulder Creek and um, I take Bear Creek Road uh, uh, used before the pandemic. I was taking it four days a week to go to San Jose. Um, since the pandemic, it's like one day a week, but in January we'll be ramping back up to three days a week. And my concern about Bear Creek Road is that overall the road itself um, is just seems to be crumbling. You know, I um, will drive down the road and notice that, you know, there's a massive pothole and then there's another massive pothole. And yes, they, they get filled and fixed, but I'm, you know, having to watch my mileage to know to when to swerve for the pothole. Like, you know, okay, at the 10 mile mark, I know I'm gonna have to swerve to this pothole. I'm also really concerned about the strength of this road because if we have another storm like we did in 2016, 2017, my belief is that this road will not survive. It seems weak in a lot of parts. I feel sometimes some of this, the road uh, dips down where I think it's going to just kind of not, it's, you know, where it dips down and where I feel it's going to crumble. It's not a very sturdy road at all. And I know that there's the project where, you know, the water line, once that gets fixed, it's, it's gonna be worked on. But I wanted to know if there's going to be any other future projects to maybe, you know, buff up that road completely because it is, it is a very shaky road to me. I, I just don't know if it, it would survive another storm like we had back in 2016, 2017. Thanks, Molly. Steve? Yeah, thank you, Molly. I appreciate your comments. I mean, we recognize that Bear Creek Road is like one of the most important roads in the valley. It really connects Boulder Creek, you know, up to Summit and over to Santa Clara County. Um, we know it gets a tremendous amount of traffic, it's like eight to 10,000 cars a day um, that commute on Bear Creek Road. And so we do focus a lot on it. Um, but to your point that it is fragile in some areas, I mean, it is a mountainous road that, you know, resides next to the creek in some areas. And it's in very, very steep terrain that geologically is challenged. Um, you know, we can't change the geology of the area, uh, but when we get when we get damaged, we do try to repair it in a way that it's not going to get damaged again. And what I'll mention about Bear Creek Road is is that it's a federal aid route. It's a it's a minor arterial. It's a really important road. And it's super important for us to capture as much federal dollars as we can to maintain Bear Creek Road. These monies come through the Regional Transportation Commission to us, and we often have to compete for these funds. And so we put our best foot forward every single time. Um, and what I know about Bear Creek Road is, as far as its maintenance goes is, you know, we did focus on the upper area between post mile five and 10. And so I think, you know, the road surface in those areas are in pretty good shape. But we do recognize that Lower Bear Creek Road uh, is in need of some resurfacing. And 
it's definitely on our priority list and we'll, we will be submitting for grants within the next couple of years to resurface Pear Creek Road. Um, you know, that said, uh, it, again, it's a fragile road um, and our limited resources will only go so far. And so we don't preemptively go out there and start building and retaining walls where we think something bad might happen. We, we have to limp the road along, maintain it as best as we can. And then when we get a storm like 2016, 17, it's not a surprise to us that we get five to seven uh, spots where there's extreme amount of damage. Uh, but we're dedicated to keeping them, you know, keeping it repaired and keeping the road up, up and running. Um, and as you see that, you know, we've been able to repair, I think, around seven projects out there. So thanks for your comments. I, they're well taken. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Molly, for the question. Okay, I'll call on Karen Vitale next. Hi, how are you, JM? Um, good, I have good. A Good, good, good. It's good to hear your voice again. Um, I have a question about the acorns. So I saw on the chart that went up that um, there was specific reference to six fort, uh, prop, you know, uh, potholes or areas that needed to be dug out around 614 and 644 acorn. Um, but we're on the third acorn and, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of potholes. There were marked years ago. They don't, they, it seemed like they didn't change a whole bunch after that. And I know there's a lot of complexity because Forest Springs neighborhood is trying to figure out how to deal with its water issues and water distribution and there may be more digging. Um, it's a very complicated issue. I wondered how is the county coordinating um, and what are the plans for dealing with the acorns more than just those right outside those two addresses that are pretty much close to the top of uh, where three and four transition. Um, so I, I will tell you, we, we are very familiar with the, the three different acorns, and, um, and I know that it's a narrow road that is in need of some work. Um, the crews do go up there and they do try to fill the potholes as they come up. Right now, there's no plan um, or funding allocated for any of the acorns to be resurfaced. Um, but what my hope is, is that as we spider our way out from the downtown areas um, and the more uh, the roads that actually have higher volumes, which is really our focus, that we'll be able to hit some of these roads um, that have much lower volumes on them that are more like neighborhood streets. Um, and our plan is only five years at a time. And so, you know, I would say sit tight, but I would not hesitate to ask you to call the road department as potholes or any type of surface damage um, occurs because we will get out there and try and repair that. And we're definitely committed to keeping, you know, the full width open. So thank you for your comments. Great, thank you. Um, and Dave Reed, did you want to add something brief to that? Um, yeah, I was just going to say for those, um, Karen, uh, and those in the Forest Springs neighborhood, um, as you know, you're, the, the consolidation with SLV Water is moving along, and they were recently awarded um, some significant funds to help with the consolidation of Forest Springs in Brackenbrae. So that may include funds to do some infrastructure improvement. And if there is infrastructure improvement, that obviously means it's gonna be work done on the roadway and there may be opportunities through that upgrade process to address some of these issues. So we'll, we'll I think Steve will work with SLV Water uh, as that project works its way through, but, but let's hope that that's a, a, an additive or a helpful um, thing on many levels. Yeah, I, and I, I might add, it just, it's a thrill. just in the last four or five days, a grant has been received. So that's great news to get us on our way to do that. Get the water district in particular, but a spinoff would, uh, would probably come uh, along with it, I think, for improving the roads as well. Great, okay, thank you everyone. Um, thanks again, Karen, for the question. And I'll now call on Jeanette Cook and you can unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, so thank you. Um, thank you, Steve, for the great presentation. Um, I, you may remember me, I live on Nelson Road, which is in Scotts Valley, but also part of District 5. And I was really happy to see that we were on your list at the very bottom, but we're on the list. Um, and uh, it looked like there were two places to be repaired. And I, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, is it the temporary bridge or is it the washout that's been there for a long time but is steadily worsening? So thank you for your questions, Jeanette. I do remember you um, and we haven't forgotten about Nelson. 
And that's one of the more complex projects, actually. We lost the entire road at that location. Um, and we were able to deploy uh, some flat car temporary bridges that were owned by the county. We got creative. That was early in the storm, actually, that we did that. Um, and, and then the other site is right before it. So basically, it includes both of them. So it will be repairing as you approach the bridge. And we'll be putting in a whole brand new crossing. Um, and so, yeah, you did see that it's on our list. Um, it was only at the bottom of the list because I think um, possibly it's alphabetical order. <laughs> but, it, but at any rate, it's, um, we're working on it. It's going to be probably a couple more years before we get to that one. I think it's going to be summer 2023. Yeah, it did say 2023. Um, so is there, um, I mean, I, I guess there's always a chance it might get further delayed, but it is, is it like funded and everything at this point? Yeah, that's the good news. It's totally funded. We're in design on it. And um, it's really, there's some very complex environmental issues there because of the creek itself. Okay. Thanks, Jeanette, for the question. Okay, we'll uh, call on Nicole. We'll make this the last question for Rhodes because I know folks, um, are likely to uh, want to hear uh, a very full presentation about fire recovery. So, Nicole, let me find you in our list here, and then I will um, ask you to unmute. There you are. Sorry, I couldn't find you. Okay. You should be able to unmute now. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm uh, Nicole from Brackenbrae, and uh, we are very much part of this consolidation with SLV. I think we have a different situation than um, Four Springs uh, because our roads are private, and we have suffered um, major deterioration between the fire initial response with the utility vehicles and the fire response um, trucks, and then with the phase two. And so um, we are seeking help. Um, to rebuild those roads um, after our homeowners finally get their permits and stuff like that. And then after the roads, um, you know, get torn up for the mainline upgrade. And so uh, we definitely would like to work with Steve and uh, Dave to find out what opportunities we can have um, in regards to doing that. Um, I was curious to know about the measure that deals with the pavement um, because we are private. Um, I'm assuming we pay into it as taxpayers. Um, how uh, communities such as us get involved in hopefully getting some assistance? That's my question. Yeah, so Bracken, as you noted, Bracken Brace private roads. And I think um, I'll, I'll have Dave um, kind of address that in his in his presentation, because I think that um, he's also got an element of pri other private roads as well that are going to be seeking help for their roads as well. Um, so sit tight, Nicole. Um, I appreciate your patience. I know um, it's difficult to watch your roads get torn up, but it is smart to wait until after all the work's done and then actually do the repairs at the end. Um, and then the one thing I'll say is, Jim, I'll go ahead and put my email address in the chat to everyone. And um, I see that there's other hands up. I see Theo, you have your hand up. If you guys want to email me your questions, I will do everything I can to get you good answers back. Um, and that's really for anybody on the call. Please feel free to email me. Great. Hey, Thanks, Mike. Steve. Okay. Appreciate it. Mike, go ahead with Theo. Yeah. Uh, Supervisor, would you like to take Theo's question? Yeah, I think, okay. I think yeah. Okay. There's just one more thing. Okay, no problem. Okay, Theo, you can unmute. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure who to direct the uh, my question to. Um, my house on Boulder Brook Drive, I see made the list. <laughs> um, had only minor damage from the fire, but I'm located below many lost homes. My property has a retaining wall that faces the road and it was damaged by the traffic from the heavy machinery during debris removal. Uh, the, the, the wall was not directly damaged by impact, but the, the compression of the road from the traffic has caused the damage. So I'm wondering what recourse I may have to recoup the repair costs. So Theo, remind me, are you on the private portion of Boulder, Brooke? Well, I'm not sure which portions are private and public, but I'm below my drone that goes up to the water plant. Okay, I, I believe that is was a private wall, but I tell you what, let me, um, uh, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and leave my email address here. 
if you email me your address and kind of give me an idea of what wall we're talking about, I'll be happy to get back to you with what I know. Um, if it's a public facility, then we're going to repair it. Um, but if it's a private retaining wall, I think it'd be up to whoever, you know, whoever's property is on to make sure that that's included in their fire repair as well. As well. Okay. So well, it's a private wall. It's on, it's my private wall, but it was you know, damaged by the debris removal. Okay, so then again, I think I'm going to have Dave go ahead and address that in his presentation as well. Um, and thank you for your questions. And thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your participation. And Bruce, thank you very much for having me this evening. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, Supervisor, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd like to introduce, um, uh, reintroduce uh, Dave Reed, uh, the director of the county's Office of Response to Recovery and Resilience. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty and I recommended the board establish this office to manage the fire recovery and a host of other issues designed to increase uh, the county's preparedness for resiliency and to natural disasters and climate change. Uh, Dave has done a ph phenomenal job. You've, many of you have seen him up there, I know, in the valley. Uh, he's got a lot on his plate and he has a just a really knack to know where to go to seek some funding or cooperative efforts of one type or another. He's been fantastic for the county. So thank you, Dave, again for your joining us this evening and uh, you can take it over. Thank you, Supervisor. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces and names. Uh, I hope you're all doing well tonight. And I'm gonna go through um, a presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen. Some of the information um, may be familiar to folks, um, but what I recognize is that um, there's, even even today I spoke with a, a constituent who hasn't started the, re the rebuild process. So, um, so I'm gonna go through things a little bit from the front end um, of the rebuild, but also a few other items as well. So um, just by way of an, a quick agenda, I wanna start off by introducing um, a new staff member to our office, um, Tatiana Brennan, is on the in the meeting today. Um, she's our new recovery and resilience analyst. Um, so I'm super excited to have Tatiana in uh, on our team. Uh, and many of you will start to see her name and see her face um, in in our recovery efforts. Um, so thank you, Tatiana, for joining us. Um, uh, Steve Wiesner mentioned uh, road damage and. Uh, to Theo, your, your question about the, the road damage, uh, I'll, I'll put in the chat a link to our OR3 website location where you can get the, um, the details on filing a damage claim. But what we have found, I think many of you know this, but what we have found and what Steve alluded to is that um, the debris removal operations process, uh, while critical for many um, to save money uh, that you folks didn't have, did a significant amount of road damage to our public county maintained road network, as Steve said, $4.4 million, but also a lot of damage to private roads and private property like Theo's wall. Um, though Steve uh, and Matt, in particular, Matt Machado, the director of public works have been doing an amazing job advocating for us at the state and local level. Um, we have not gotten the response that I feel like we deserve um, in regards to this damage. So next Tuesday, we are going to have a board meeting. Um, I'll be giving a very short presentation, some of the content which you saw tonight from Steve, presenting to the board and asking the board to give us direction to advocate in person with our legislative delegation, our um, Anna Eshoo, Congresswoman Eshoo's office, uh, Assembly Member Mark Stone's office, and Senator Laird's office, as well as Bruce and Ryan, um, Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty. We need to meet in person with our state uh, Cal OES representatives to try and get them to move off of the position that they've had, which is candidly to deny the damage claims that many of you have filed. Um, FEMA has denied. Um, our claims for the damage, um, stating explicitly that they don't think that FEMA should pay for it because it's damage done by Anvil um, during their debris removal process and that the state should cover those costs. So we need to escalate and elevate um, this issue on behalf of all of our fire families as well as the county. And so that item next Tuesday um, is an opportunity for any of you 
who have lived through that dance storm, that road damage experience to voice your, your experience. We encourage you to do that. Um, and we want to just lend more um, effort to trying to get the state to, and Anvil to pay for some of this road damage. Um, and then I'm going to go through quick rebuild path stuff. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the CZU rebuild directive, Atkins debris flow study, and then just to reiterate a few things as uh, Supervisor McPherson mentioned around debris flow winter preparations. So I'm going to go through, there's a lot of words in the slides. Um, uh, JM from, from Bruce's office will put this presentation up on the website. Um, we'll try and also get it up on the OR3 website so you can review it um, a little bit slower. But by way of starting, um, I wanted to just reiterate the rebuild path for folks. Some folks are deep into this path and others have not started. So as a reminder, the best place to start is a pre-application meeting with our recovery permit center. That's the standalone um, permit support center that helps all fire families um, as well as purchasers of land in the CZU burn area navigate the permit and rebuild process. Um, so that phone number there um, is a great way to start if you haven't engaged with them. The next step is really getting your pre-clearances and what those are, there's three pre-clearances. Many of you know this. Um, there's a septic pre-clearance requirement, a fire, um, water, so set the environmental health is septic and water requirements, fire, and then geologic. Um, but to do that, you need a site plan. Um, the long-term recovery group um, has gotten a deal with getasiteplan.com and they're familiar with what is required here at the county. So if you haven't done that yet, you can go to that um, website listed there and there's a, re and there's a discount code um, to getting those site plans. So once you get the site plan, you can submit and try and get your pre-clearances. As I said, there's three of those, the environmental health, which deals with public, your water and your sewer. Some of you, as we discussed, are on public water. Some of you are on public sewer or municipal sewer of some sort. Um, a couple neighborhoods that are in that set situation. And then many of you are on septic and private wells. So just making sure that those things are in working order um, is the primary goal. Um, one important note that has come up a couple different times and is related to the, the new local area management plan that was adopted, the LAMP, um, that many folks have heard about. Um, in some conversations I've had with the Recovery Permit Center, um, they have said that folks have come in and said they want to build an ADU and another house in their main house and they want to do all of this work and it exceeds the capacity of the existing septic system. And that means that they're required to build a new septic system. And if you're required to build a new septic system because you're increasing the size of your home over what it was, you will be subject to the new code requirements. And what some fire families have found is that those new requirements are cross prohibitive. So they've had to scale back their project to be more in kind with what was there before. So keep those things in mind as you evaluate how you want to rebuild. Um, the second one is the geologic hazard clearance. I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, but for many of you familiar with this, there's a couple different options. Some folks get screened out of that requirement. Others need a geologic hazard assessment, and then some folks need a full geologic report. Um, I can answer questions, but again, um, you can review some of this content once it's posted online. The last one for folks in the Valley um, is the fire access clearance. And for many of you, um, this um, we thought this was gonna be the biggest hurdle at the front end of the rebuild process, but what we know to be true is that many of the fire districts, Boulder Creek, Ben Lomond, Felton, have been issuing the clearances for everyone without issue. So generally speaking, this has been an easy clearance for folks to get. Once you get those three clearances, you can submit your building plans um, for your home and still it's about a seven to 10 day turnaround to getting your building permit once you submit your building plans. Um, a little bit of detail on the CZ rebuild directive. We had a community meeting a little less than a month ago, but just to go over this for folks, this is the path that you can take if you don't want to follow our chapter 1610 requirements um, and you want to build and get your clearance um, without having to do a site-specific geologic report if you're in a hazardous area. 
there are ways in which you can substitute that report and I'll go ahead and get into that in a second. But for those who want to build in the CZU, use the CZU rebuild directive, a couple of key things about eligibility. You need to have owned the property at the time of the fire um, and the property needed to be considered legal and non or legal non-conforming um, based on construction before 1986. The other piece that's important, and I know this has come up with a couple folks in the Valley, is that you're, you need to be rebuilding within 10% of the original structure size. So if you're building a, a much larger home, then you're not eligible for this, this resource. Um, and then the last thing is the recording of a notice of geologic hazards. Um, this document, this, this slide, folks have probably seen this before. I won't go into too much detail, but just to highlight that if you do choose to use the CZU rebuild directive, and there have been folks in the in the burn area that have started to use this, um, and you meet the eligibility requirements, you get your geologic clearance issued. Um, and if you have your other two clearances, you're ready to go and move through the process, um, provided you're working with a geotechnical engineer who meets the requirements of the California Building Code. So we don't have any authority over the minimum standards of the California Building Code. So just to keep that in mind, um, certainly I can get deeper into the weeds on that, but just keep that in mind that if you do do the CZ Rebuild Directive route, your geotechnical engineer is responsible for making sure that you meet the minimum design standards of the California Building Code. Um, if you follow the standard Chapter 1610 process, particularly if you're in the Atkins debris flow area, you can um, substitute the site-specific geologic report for that Atkins study. Um, in many instances, that's helped save tens of thousands of dollars for folks um, in not having to do that site-specific geology. So a lot of words here, but again, um, take a look and, and I'll put my email in again at the, at the end if there are further questions. Um, the Atkins debris flow study, just to go through this real quick, um, in the valley, we studied a number of drainages um, along the 236 corridor. So here's, it's hard to see, but the red is 236 and then Highway 9. The purple is some of the study areas. And then um, the other colors are the primary and uncertain debris flow paths. So I'm just going to tick through just to explain this a little bit. Um, this is Boulder Brook. Uh, this is some aerial imagery from 2020. This is what a lot of people have seen. This is kind of a terrain map. So this is what the topography looks like. Um, this is the first set of data that came out of that study that was funded by the Community Foundation. So the, the pink color, red pink, reddish pink, is the primary debris flow path. And then the, the pale yellow is the uncertain debris flow path. A lot of folks are familiar with this, but that was the first set of data that came out of that study. The second set of data I'll show you in a second, but I just want to remind folks as you look at some of this on our GIS website, um, I, I, show, I highlight this because the parcel layer um, in certain neighborhoods like this one in Boulder Brook does not reflect, um, is not accurate. The, the debris flow study is accurate to the topography, the topography is accurate, but you may need to work with your consultant team to make sure that you're looking at the right information and where your parcel lies in any given spot. Um, the other data that came out of the study was debris flow depth. And uh, you can see that uh, there's actually another layer that shows the flow depths um, in the contour line. So, that, so in the valley, generally speaking, um, in most locations, uh, the debris flow depth is you know, one to four feet. Um, so there's lots of instances where folks are able to do some mitigation measures to, to mitigate the hazard because the flow depths are not um, tremendously deep. The other piece that came out of that study was the debris flow velocity. Um, those two data points, the velocity and depth, can be used by your consultant team to help design your foundation to meet the minimum building code requirements of the California Building Code. Um, the last thing I want to touch on, and then I'm happy to answer as many questions as we have time for, and I know I've gone through this quickly, um, just to save as much time for questions. Is, as Supervisor McPherson said, we 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 had our first big atmospheric river event of the season on the 24th. Um, some areas got north of 10 to 12 inches of rain, but fortunately, it never 
came in the extreme um, exceedance uh, levels to, to, to potentially cause a debris flow. But we want to make sure everybody's vigilant um, and is signed up for Code Red. Uh, and you can go to the scr911.org um, to register for Code Red. Want to make sure everybody knows their zones. That will be how we notify you if you have an evacuation warning or an evacuation order. We've tried to pare down the size of those zones a little bit based on that Atkins study so that we only evacuate the folks that are in critical danger. That was another benefit of that study funded by the Community Foundation. Um, and then just understanding and paying attention to all of the normal media channels to help you get prepared um, if an event uh, is, is forecasted, we'll certainly let you know. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll put this up for a second and then I'm happy to put my contact information again in the chat. But um, our little office, uh, or three office, um, there's myself, Tatiana, who I introduced as our recovery and resilience analyst. And then Lisa Eret is our emergency management analyst. So she's dealing with a lot of our uh, EOC and emergency management work. And then Karen Adler is another uh, critical support member of our team as well at OR3. So with that, I'll stop sharing um, and happy to help facilitate questions with JM that anybody might have on any of that stuff or, or other things uh, related to fire recovery. Great. Thank you, Dave. Um, and just again, to remind folks, you can raise your hand in Zoom, or if you're on the phone, you can press star nine uh, to let us know that you uh, have a question. So I'm looking for any hands, um, questions about fire recovery or three, let's see. Not seeing any right away. Um, I'll stick around. And something comes up. I don't know if Jim Moser is trying to say something. He's on mute. Jim, Jim, do you have a question about this topic? You're on mute. Yes, I, I can. Maybe not. Jim, no, I just, uh, here I am. Here I am. Um, there's no hand to raise on my screen. So that's why I haven't been able to raise my hand. Okay. I don't know if other people are having that same experience. Uh, well, I'm not sure we had folks able to do it um, earlier. No, I had so. the hand at the previous presentation, but this pre it went away. Anyway, okay. um, I do have a question. For, uh, can I go ahead? Or, um, yes, wait, is this about fire recovery, Jim? This is about the debris flow uh, alert system sure. that uh, Dave talked okay. about. And as uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson, as you know, on behalf of the Friends of San Lorenzo Valley Water, we submitted a memorandum to you about the experience up here with the debris flow um, evacuation orders. Many of us uh, got a code red uh, automated phone call and text uh, telling us that we needed to evacuate, um, yet we were not in an evacuation zone. And when we called the emergency number, we were told to ignore the calls that we got with code red. It caused a lot of confusion up here. We weren't the only ones. We're in the Felton 003A. Um, 3B was to be evacuated, but not 3A. But I've talked to, I probably have heard from 15 to 20 people here in Felton that got these calls who are not in an evacuation zone. And my second concern is that, in fact, many of the evacuation zones, there is not a critical life threatening danger that people face. And the zone haven, if you uh, cross reference the zone haven map with the Atkins map, you find that many of the many of us are being told to evacuate because we may be facing a road closures um, and be trapped. And uh, it's critical for people up here to know the reason for the evacuation. And I think that this is contributing to the uh, evacuations fatigue up here. And that, uh, according to the press banner, only one third of those folks that the sheriff visited actually evacuated. And, uh, and my understanding is that those are the folks who we really want to be sure are safe because they are in a potentially life-threatening situation if we have a big storm. So I'm wondering, uh, well, uh, if we have another one of these storms, is this code red automatic phone call is going to be fixed? And can we have the map, uh, can we have the zone, uh, the evacuation orders uh, provide more information on the reason for the uh, evacuation order, whether it's life-threatening or 
because there may be, uh, you may be trapped in your home for some days, an experience that many of us have experienced up here uh, many, many times. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe, maybe Steve, before you begin, uh, or excuse not Steve, Dave, excuse me. Uh, yeah, I did get your notice. Uh, thank you, Jim. And, uh, uh, you had, what, five or six questions in the first go around, and now you've added three or four more, which are legitimate. And uh, I think that uh, Dave would be able to answer them more uh, concisely, uh, but we are looking into it. I can tell you that, that we, we have to be more refined in how we address this, for sure. But go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think um, you, you're very astute in the sense that we are in the process of refining some of the zones. Ironically, the Friday before the big storm, so it was like the Friday, um, not directly before, so it was 10 days before the storm hit, we had a meeting with our um, fire uh, chiefs in the San Lorenzo Valley, as well as our Cal Fire chief, to, to start planning the refinement of the zones based on the Atkins data. Um, and then the forecasted storm uh, hit us that following week and we were not able to fully implement the changes to zone haven based on that refinement. Um, so we are breaking up some of the larger zones into sub zones um, based on that exact point where we want to try and focus and narrow who ev is evacuated to those that are in most danger. We also are refining the number of homes that um, they would go door to door um, to notice, to, to really refine that to those that are in most, uh, in most imminent life, life safety if there was a debris flow. So we're definitely using the data to improve it. This storm was admittedly earlier and bigger in the season than we, than we thought. We thought we, had a, we thought we had a few more weeks before the rains were going to hit when we had that meeting, you know, nine days prior. Um, so we're making some improvements. And then I will follow up with um, our NETCOM folks on the discrepancy you said between Felton uh, 003A and 3B. Is that the two zones that you said were kind of, um, there was- it, some... it was it was more than just our zones. There are people uh, uh, across Felton who got these calls erroneously. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll look into that as well. I appreciate the, the, the update. And yeah, we definitely, we definitely are, are working with our local geologists to evaluate whether the thresholds for evacuation need to change. And we also recognize evacuation fatigue and we don't want to, and we want to be uh, very prudent in when we use that tool of asking folks to evacuate. So definitely take that, that um, to heart. And then what I will say, just for clarity, because you brought this up, Jim, is um, under the reactions, there's a little button at the bottom of your, of your window that says reactions. It should have a little smiley face with a plus sign for folks who don't know. If you click on that button, it should give you the option to raise your hand. So if folks aren't familiar, some of the different Zoom meeting setups um, are a little bit different where the hand is just there. And in this particular Zoom setup, that's where you find it. Great, thanks, Jim. Okay, um, continuing on with questions regarding fire recovery or the OR3 office, um, looks like Mary S. Um, you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so yeah, thanks for doing this. I think I'm really beginning to understand the pathway. Um, I'm a real map person, and I remember on, on the day of the Board of Supervisors meeting, there was a link for the GIS maps, and, but now when I try to follow the directions on the OR3 website, I can't get to those same maps. Um, am I, <laughs> is it because I don't understand the links, or is there a new system that I, that's in place? Um, yeah, let me look into that. Remind, um, wait, so sorry, you said they were on which map, which maps on the website were are so both originally, there? yeah, they were on your OR3 website. There was a link, but now, uh, when I follow the directions that are there, 
I think I got them from your website. I can't seem to get to the the same maps. Okay. Um, let me. Ha I'll have you email me, and then let's. And then I can work through that with you offline. Okay. And uh, just one other question. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to see if I have enough money to to use the Atkins report and um, may, perhaps do the mitigation. So that's kind of up in the air, but I was also wondering if you were still going to do a permit calculator thing on your, um, on the website somewhere so that we can figure out how much the building permit. So I can figure out if I have enough money for uh, the rebuild. <laughs> Yeah, I think so, Mary. Great question. I think the best thing for you to do on that piece is it's um, what we have found uh, is that the permit costs are very site specific and project specific. And so, the recovery permit center, if you start working through the pre clearance process and you are saying and you articulate that you're building like for like. Um, you know they're going to be able to give you a better sense of what those costs are many of the fees um, Supervisor McPherson and the board reduced and eliminated, um, but we didn't build a calculator because it's very site specific. Um, oh, okay. so we, did, we didn't want it to be misleading. So the recovery permit center is well versed in giving you a sense of what those costs are. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. Um, next up, I saw the hand from Kirsten Flynn. Kirsten, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I would love for David to maybe run through what the, um, well, I wrote down the name of it, but now I can't find my piece of paper, uh, what the changes are to the septic requirements or how, to, how those might be best worked with for fire rebuilding families. Yeah, so so um, I'm I'm not the expert. Um, Marilyn Underwood from our environmental health team, for for those of you who worked with her through the, the debris removal, is our our uh, lamp guru. But for fire families, the general consensus um, sh information that I've been sharing is we want it to the to the greatest extent possible. We want to use your existing systems. Um, that's going to be the cheapest path for most of you. And so what that means is you can build like for like. Um, you can, there is some ways in which you can add square footage to your home if, you, if you're not adding a bedroom. Um, the bedroom count is one of the critical pieces in defining the size of a septic system. So there are ways to build a slightly larger home um, provided you're not adding a quote study or or reading room or something that could be construed as a bedroom, um, and then obviously there's there's a couple processes where you have to have the the site inspected, the septic system and septic leach fields inspected to make sure they weren't damaged and they're still functioning. Um, for those of you that are on the Highway 236 corridor in particular. Um, if you do have septic issues or maybe your septic system was um, struggling or uh, potentially failing, there is a path where um, we are offering folks the opportunity to sign a document that basically says, if the county is able to embark upon a, a sewering project, which basically is extending the CSA that serves the Boulder Creek Golf and Country Club area, if we're able to extend that project in the next five years, and that's definitely a work program that Tatiana and I will be working on, but if we're able to extend that um, or start working on that in earnest, um, as long as you agree to tie into that system, you don't need to upgrade your septic system now. So our hope is that we can provide a solution to a lot of the 236 residents who have particularly challenging septic issues. Um, with that project uh, in, the, in the coming years. Um, so I hope that helps um, answer some of the questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, there are very specific things about groundwater separation between the old regulations and new regulations and setback requirements. I don't have them off the top of my head. I do think we're, we're trying to consolidate all that information and have that um, 
available on our website. So we'll I often that. try to take good notes, not so much because I need them, but because I, you know, <laughs> want to take care of my Clear Creek neighbors and not all of them usually show up for these meetings. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kirsten. Okay, uh, Karen, Vitali, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, it seems like a relatively minor comment in the scope of things, but I've noticed that recently the County of Santa Cruz uh, updated their website, the home page, and it's almost impossible to find the recovery information. I've, I've been stubborn and finally did find it under environmental health, but um, the stuff that used to be in a banner up at the top so that we could figure out the CZU recovery process is now gone and that stuff does get updated. So I'm, I look at it at least once a week. So I'd like to say, you know, sort of as a public service would be really good to make that easy to find again. It's uh, very frustrating when you're first digging through to find out where the heck it went. Yeah, so let me share with everybody because that's a good point. I noticed the other day that that banner and our COVID banner disappeared. There's two ways that you can get to the recovery information. Under the departments tab um, at the top of our county pipe page, and why don't I just go ahead and share my screen again, um, just so that folks can see this. Um, uh, so, hide that. So the county's website looks like this now. Um, as Karen said, there used to be some banners at the top that said CZU fire and COVID. Those are no longer here. If you go under the departments tab, you can come down to our office, the Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience. You can click there and you can get to the recovery information um, and all of the things therein. Um, or the other way that you can get there is through the planning department website. So if you click on the planning department, there still is a button for CZU lightning fire and that will bring you to the recovery permit center page. So um, great feedback, uh, Karen, on that piece. And, and I'll see if there's a place on that landing page where we can still keep that a little bit more prevalent. And I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thank you again, Karen. Um, any other questions for um, Dave Reed on, on fire recovery or uh, other work that his office is undertaking. All right. Uh, thank you, Dave and Tatiana, both for being here this evening. Um, we have about 20 minutes uh, left in the, the scheduled time with the community tonight. And so I um, uh, wanted to open the floor up to questions not related to our um, the topics we've already covered. If there's any sort of more uh, general topic that folks have a question on for, um, for the supervisor um, or staff, uh, we're happy to entertain those now. And again, you can raise your hand and mute through reactions um, and you can press star nine if you're joining us by phone. Okay, Jim Mosier, um, you have uh, another question. So I'm gonna uh, ask you to unmute. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Great. And I learned how to raise my hand. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, this is a question of you, Supervisor McPherson, and it has to do with what you talked about briefly at the beginning of the meeting, which is the redistricting process. And I'm interested in your thoughts about what happened today uh, at the Board of Supervisors meeting. And just to give folks a little background, I was actually the person that you um, appointed to the advisory commission to advise the district, the uh, board on uh, how to uh, do the redistricting. And our commission met uh, starting in uh, July and had several meetings. Uh, and the proposal that was, um, that one of the pro two proposals a week we're considering for District 5 was one, whether Scotts Valley, the rest of Scotts Valley should be brought into Scott into District 5. Right now, Scotts Valley is split. Uh, the portion west of 17 is in our district. The portion east is in District 1. Uh, and the other uh, proposal, uh, well, one of the other proposals was to 
um, move, uh, make District 5 more uh, a rural district, include Bonnie Dune and move west. And we had comments, not much public participation, but we had more comments actually about needing District 5 to represent more of the mountain area and less of Scotts Valley. And we did have some people from Scotts Valley who asked that uh, Scotts Valley be brought together. Uh, we considered these uh, proposals and uh, for a variety of reasons, I, I don't wanna go into that now, um, uh, but for a variety of reasons, the commission uh, uh, proposed no changes to District 5 uh, after considering uh, a, a, a lot of input and from staff and from uh, looking at the maps and understanding some of the challenges with the rebuilding process for folks and changing supervisor offices might not be a good thing at this time. In any case, we took those recommendations to the board. The board met last week, there were no comments. And then here at the last moment, uh, the mayor of Scotts Valley writes a letter to the board uh, saying they wanna uh, bring Scotts Valley whole into District 5. And uh, the board uh, uh, is now seriously considering this possibility. And at this last minute when people have very limited time uh, to uh, comment on it and to get involved. And so I'm dismayed by the process, uh, apart from the, uh, you know, I, uh, the commission put a lot of time into this and a lot of thought and the board uh, didn't ask for any, uh, any of us to uh, brief them on why we uh, came up with the proposal that we did. Uh, so I'm, I'm just surprised and I wondered if you had any comments about the process and any advice to folks on how we might influence this decision and get involved. Yeah, thank you, first of all, for being uh, my appointee to that redistricting commission. And it was a tight timeline because usually you can take about a year to get to this. And because of COVID and all, uh, and a delayed census, because you want to have the five supervisorial districts of which the County Board of Supervisors can uh, determine where those district lines are drawn, unlike the federal uh, congressional and state assembly and senate districts are drawn, that's by a state commission. Um, I was uh, kind of set back and uh, surprised myself, frankly, about um, the vote today, that it brought more information to the board, uh, including, uh, I think there's four different proposed maps. Um, and um, I, I was really concerned that um, this hasn't been really discussed uh, or brought to fruition uh, or brought to the point of the commission before this in, in such a strong manner. But we do need to have more public input. We are going to be meeting again to discuss this. We have to approve this by December uh, as a board of supervisors or the state will come in and draw the lines for us. So it's important we get this done ourselves. Um, and I do think there needs, there will be more public input. The meeting, uh, we have a, a time specific a week from today, Tuesday, uh, the 16th at 1045 in the board chamber, but it is a virtual meeting. So you can address the board at that, but we need more uh, input from uh, Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley residents uh, that can give us, um, you know, uh, some of their opinions on this brought to the board, but the, the main issue you're talking to is uh, the city of Scotts Valley would like to be whole uh, in one district. Uh, each of the cities and the four cities in Santa Cruz are split between at least two districts, uh, not evenly, but there's a piece of some put out, so it's not unusual. Um, they Some people think there's an advantage to that because it gets the city and county uh, representatives to talk more to each other. I think there has been some really good um, um, cooperative ventures between Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley recently with the Santa Margarita Water uh, Management District that we're about to complete as well. Uh, there was an emergency water situation, but um, I, um, even though I said, okay, we'll, we'll delay this to discuss it next week, uh, but I'm not sure that uh, how the, the board will go. There seem to be uh, three supervisors uh, that, not including me, that uh, had spoken in favor of this uh, becoming, uh, Scotts Valley becoming, getting into one supervisorial district, that would be mine. Uh, there were some proposals 
to do much of the same to take, but just to take a piece of the University of California. Uh, we have the, uh, the faculty housing there, but uh, uh, that that was not really brought up seriously at this meeting yesterday or today. So um, I, I um, I'm really hesitant to change. I think people like stability and where they are. It's critical and it's it's uh, legal. Legally, you have to get the district split up into five. Uh, we're talking population, not voters. Uh, we have about population of 272,000. So it's 54, 55,000 people per district. And you have to be within 5% of each other uh, to, to have equality among the, the five districts. Um, it's complicated. Uh, I was um, really... Uh, I'm kind of surprised that this came up on so strong and there's four different maps I believe we're going to be looking at. Uh, I do, I can't tell you how the board might go, but that's the way it came up today. And uh, I'm not, I, I surely can't predict how it might turn out, but um, I, um, I'm a little dismayed about the, the late entry of this uh, in the process. And I, I can, I can assure Assume that, as you have said, you are too, because uh, you've spent a lot of the five commission, the commission appointees spent a lot of time on this, and there were two relatively minor changes that were going to that seem to be moving, moving forward, and then some of these other suggestions came up. So rather than we have, the, we do have the time, but not much time left, and so that's why the the board decided to continue it at this time. Thank you, Jim, for that question. Again, thank you for your service on that commission. Um, I'll ask again for any other hands on topics uh, that we haven't covered this evening, uh, but Supervisor, in the chat, um, uh, Karen is asking if we could provide more detail around the Big Basin water system and potential consolidation with SLV water. Would you like to field that one? And I'm happy to um, provide some additions as well. Yeah, and, and uh, Jam, you and I, we've been in, engaged in this and trying to make this become a reality more than a year ago. Um, uh, we didn't see a, a disaster coming like the fires, but uh, that really kind of flipped the switch to uh, have big bases say, we just don't have the, the financial resources to upgrade. And thankfully, the San Luis Valley Water District, as I mentioned with uh, Rick Rogers, and I attended their meeting Thursday night, uh, we want to look into it. It goes, has to go to the local for agency formation commission, um, and it will take some time. It'll take grant money from the state and federal government, probably the state in particular, to make something happen there. Uh, this could be a at least a year or two year long process to get through the whole process. Uh, in the meantime, I think San Lorenzo Valley Water District will be moving forward to serve the customers of Big Basin, I, I don't want to put the onus on their back, but they have been tremendous neighbors to provide water for the Big Basin customers. As I said, there's about just short of 500 connections up there, but um, I am very anxious to make this happen ASAP, and um, it's, it's got to happen. Uh, I think one of the things that the the Big Basin customer, and we don't have it's jurisdiction over it, as I think I said, it's a, uh, a private company. So the uh, California Public Utilities Commission has the control over that. And so it's really uh, up to the state officials to say, you've got to do something and let's move on and get it going right now. And they have heard us loud and clear, not unlike the, the PG&E with uh, the PUC now too. Uh, so I feel very good. It takes more time than you want, but I think we're, I feel better now than I ever have that uh, Big Basin will have ample and uh, consistent water in the, in the next year or two. And uh, we're gonna do everything we can to make that happen as quickly as possible. And Jam, you've um, attended several of our meetings and a couple of, well, we've been independent on a couple of them. Do you have any other added comments that you'd like to make on that? Um, I would only just say that um, what what will take place, I believe, over the next few months is that the San Lorenzo Valley Water District will um, do its due diligence in terms of 
um, engineering studies and so on to just determine what from an infrastructure perspective um, would be required to uh, fully hook into the system as well as um, just evaluating uh, potential future costs and then um, we'll, we'll be bringing that information back to their board. Um, and so that's that's the next few months and we can continue to update the community on on that. Um, and I wonder if if um, Dave uh, Reed would want to just add some comments about how this piece uh, fits into um, strategic objectives of not only the county, but also um, the state water resources control board. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think um, I'm, I'm deeply heartened, as Supervisor McPherson said, by the um, the board of, of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District to consider this effort. Um, it really does build resilience for the entire valley to consolidate these small water districts like Bracken Bray, Forest Springs, and Big Basin into the, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, I think long term having uh, that unification will be a, a really um, powerful uh, tool for resilience um, as we continue to face impacts from climate change. So we're wanting to be as supportive as we can. As, as the supervisor said, we don't have jurisdiction over it, but whatever ways we can be of, of service and support to the, the, the water district, we want to do that because this is a, a tremendous opportunity to bring consistent water um, to all of those customers in Big Basin. It's a great way to address some of the concerns of the fire families who are rebuilding, who have been concerned about water supply for some of the new code requirements around hydrants and sprinkler systems. Um, so it's just, uh, it, it's a tremendous opportunity. It's a generational opportunity to consolidate these water districts. So really hopeful that it all works out and we can find the right resources to support the ratepayers of the basin as well as to support the district. And I would just add to that, this is an opportunity to keep ownership of the water local um, rather than the company selling to potentially an out of out of area provider. Um, and I would just add to that um, there's unprecedented amounts of grant funding on the state and federal level for infrastructure projects. And we're just starting to learn about some of those details especially on the federal package, but, um, but this, is, this, is an, it, this, this um, opportunity is coming at an advantageous time from a, from a financial perspective that could help us um, quite significantly reduce the cost to rate payers. Um, Karen, you had asked that question. I see you have your hand up again. Um, you're the only one who has your hand up, so I'm happy to call on you again if you like to just, if you have a quick follow-up question. Yes, I, I do. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh -huh. I'm getting messages on my screen. Okay. So um, I guess for us, as uh, Dave touched on briefly, for the fire families, the challenge is it looks like, um, you know, in my, my discussions with Chief Bingham, that unless we put tanks on the property to feed water to our fire suppression system, they're not going to, the fire department will not sign off on a certificate of occupancy. That's the current that's what I heard from him the last time I spoke with him. And um, I, I, I think there's a whole rabbit hole of issues that come up with that. One of them is the cost of the tanks. The other is an entire neighborhood full of the tanks if everyone decides to go ahead with building. And the, the third is, is just, you know, are the, the lots themselves suitable for these multiple water tanks that would have to be involved? So the, the timeline for SLV consolidation um, of bringing in neighborhoods like the Forest Springs Water Association, those issues start to become really critical. And I know Sean Machado, who's the, the um, head of the board there at, at Forest Springs is on the call too. But I just wanna bring up the fact that I, I know you guys have been pushing on this issue for a year, but for us rebuilding people, now we're looking at, say if we get rebuilt in nine months, say if we get rebuilt in a year, let's be really super optimistic. Um, we have to address putting water into our uh, fire suppression system. And as of right now, we can't unless we put tanks up. Dave, would you yeah, like to feel so that, that That's the first, um, that's the first I've heard of that with Chief Bingham. So I think 
um, you know, Jam and I can reach out to the chief and maybe have a conversation with him as well as the water district um, and make sure that we're all on the same page. And if there's some near term um, lower hurdles that we can we can accommodate, because it certainly agree it makes sense that if we're going to consolidate and the water pressure is coming to make you spend the money on water tanks, um, that seems uh, punitive. So we can look into that for sure. Yeah, we'll follow up with you on that, Karen. Um, we have about three minutes left. Um, I'll open it up again just for one additional question, if anyone has it uh, on, on any topic. Um, not seeing anything, so um, Supervisor, I'll turn it over to you to make some just closing yeah. comments. Well, I just want to thank everyone uh, for participating this evening. Uh, it was great to have the opportunity to share uh, what our office is working on and to hear your questions and, and your feedback. Um, and we, we will follow up and get in touch with you. And please do not hesitate to get in touch with our office. Uh, I want to thank Steve Wiesner again and Dave Reed for participating tonight. Uh, the recording of the meeting would be posted on my website at the county and uploaded to my office uh, Facebook uh, page. Uh, we've scheduled another town hall meeting at 5.30 on Wednesday, December 8th to hear updates on the Boulder Creek Branch Library. And there's some really nice things going to happen there. The Felton Library has been a phenomenal addition to the Valley. And you're going to be very pleased with the... Uh, with the Boulder Creek Branch Library System too. And we'll have other topics as well, but that'll be a main one because it's about ready to get going and opening. Uh, so if there is a topic that you would like uh, us to cover, please send an email to uh, district at santacruzcounty.us. That's district at santacruzcounty.us. And then uh, we can, uh, have those uh, subject matters included in our December 8th meeting at uh, 5.30. Uh, so I appreciate very much your enthusiasm and your attention that you're, you're giving to this. Uh, we will uh, try to answer any uh, hanging, hangover questions, shall we say, that, uh, that we can get answers to. Uh, we, will, we will get them to you as soon as possible. Uh, again, I want to thank Steve Wiesner and Dave Reed for participating. And everybody, have a great, nice, wet evening, but I think the rain has stopped for now. So have a good one. See you later. Good night. Good night.